Hey, hi. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay. I'm going to have some more coffee. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Megan Dean. I'm assistant professor of uh, philosophy at Michigan State University. It's morning here since the coffee. Um, need for coffee. Uh, welcome to the um, this meeting of the 2022 spring session of the Half-Baked Online Colloquia series. Uh, this series is part of the Activities of Culinary Mind, which is a leading international center promoting philosophical thinking on food. This series is organized by Andrea Borghini, Beatrice Sorini, Nicola Pires, and myself. Um, and it aims to highlight new work on philosophical issues pertaining to food and eating practices, to spark discussion and debate, and to connect scholars working in this area. Uh, if you want to retrieve videos of our past events, you can go to our webpage um, under the media section. And if you want to stay up to date uh, with Culinary Mind News, you can subscribe to our mailing list on our webpage or um, text us. Um, so now it is a pleasure for me to introduce Uku Tumi. Uku is a research fellow in theoretical philosophy at the University of Tartu. He works on philosophy of mind with interest in aesthetics, specifically the structure of aesthetic appreciation, uh, as well as epistemology. And among his recent publications of interest to uh, culinary mind folks is a paper uh, called The Aesthetics of Food Porn. Um, but today, Uku will talk to us about um, flavor in the moment. So please join me in welcoming Uku. Cool. Um... Hopefully everyone can see the slides, I guess, I hope. Um, so first I would like to just say thank you to, for the organizer, to the organizers for inviting me. I've been attending the last two sessions and it's been really, really fun. Um, and also I like the interdisciplinary aspect of, of, the, of the series. I myself, I, I, my area is I mean, as you could say, maybe pure philosophy, I guess it's not maybe that interdisciplinary. Although my, as Megan, I think mentioned, my main area is philosophy of mind. So there's is this sort of some like interdisciplinary elements in my research as well. Research as well. But yeah, although I work on philosophy of mind, first and foremost, in the last maybe almost, almost five years, I've been really interested in aesthetics as well. And been quite active and trying to like work on on topics in aesthetics. And I guess if I would try to like formulate this kind of general project I, I want to pursue, so I could would say that I'm interested in this, uh, like you could say like ordinary aesthetic life of uh, li limited agents, and and what the rules and 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 values of that kind of uh, ordinary aesthetic life are. And within that context, I've been especially interested in this kind of weird aesthetic domain. So that, that's why I've been writing about uh, uh, food porn and uh, bad movies. But uh, the stuff I'm going to want to want to try uh, that I want to talk about today is maybe a bit less silly, but it uh, also concerns the this kind of ordinary aesthetic consumers and, and how, how their appreciation uh, of aesthetic domains looks like. Um, so maybe it's good to begin with the autobiographical note. In a way, this uh, talk is the most personal talk I've ever given <laughs> in aesthetics, perhaps. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, this sort of Starting with this autobiographical note this is is kind of useful and, and pertinent. So uh, years ago, four or five years ago, I lived in Boston uh, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, to be more exact. And since it's an expensive place and I didn't have much money, I lived on a budget. And I was always trying to like find places. Uh, where I could could have some food that's uh, affordable but still still special, and so probably my favorite uh, place that I found was a place called Kimchi Kimchi Kitchen, uh, which unfortunately is closed now, so uh, you can't go there. 
but uh, the kimchi fried rice that 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 place uh, served that became my like eating that each week became almost like my ritual and so uh, i got i got to know that dish really well at least how it was served in that place and from that time then already i had this kind of um sense that there's a certain similarity between how uh, at least I and I hope like so many other people also uh, there's a similarity between how, how people uh, engage with some of their favorite dishes and their favorite songs and so it seemed to me that maybe it's fruitful to think of, of, of to compare food appreciation and, and uh, music appreciation in parallel and see if, if they can like illuminate one another, one another. but uh, it's only now when I've now like tried to formulate my thoughts more, more, more clearly. Uh, still, this is very much. Uh, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to say. It's very much a work in progress, but it's so much work in progress that uh, I, I, I suspect that uh, depending on your feedback, uh, it might not even result in a paper. It's just it's very much I'm, I'm kind of exploring and, and trying trying this out these ideas. Um, so that's the preliminary. That's the autobiographical note. Now, the, now come the preliminary, preliminaries, actually. And there's a bunch of them, actually, uh, just to introduce this, this topic uh, more closely. So I, I, su I suppose it's, it's like acceptable <laughs> to say that uh, at food and Popular music in particular are not usually seen as paragons of aesthetic value. I forgot to qualify what I talked earlier. I, I'm focusing on popular music. Uh, so not classical, not, not jazz, but like rock, pop, uh, electronic dance music. I mean, it's very, still very broad, but I hope like we have this kind of intuitive sense of what pop, popular music uh, is uh, in contrast with, uh, with classical or, or jazz, for instance. Um, so in any case, uh, it seems that, that uh, food and popular music are not usually seen as paragons of aesthetic value. They usually are assigned to these lo lower arts and, and they don't really, at least historically, they haven't re received maybe that as much uh, philosophical attention as some other art forms or aesthetic domains. But I mean, it's very welcoming train trend in recent decades already that that people have become more and more interested in, 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 in both of those domains. But still, I mean, it's just like historically, there seems to be this kind of uh, certain view on certain view on, on food and popular music that sees it sees them in a like more in kind of as something relatively low, so to speak. Um, but it's also, I think, uh, as an empirical guess, I, I think it's true that that food and popular music uh, in a contemporary world are maybe a, those domains that are central to aesthetic lives of a like, large number of people. So that's where like when people, if you, if you talk about uh, uh, what is like, what matters aesthetically for, for like regular people, I mean, it's very like big term, maybe. but what matters to people very often is, is like, Aesthetically, is, 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 is food and, and popular music. And another qualification regarding uh, popular music, I also am interested in recorded uh, music in particular. Um, so, um, now, like looking back again at my autobiographical description. And now we can like think of the, like now I can say, state the aim of, of this, this talk. So my aim is to explore what it means to aesthetically appreciate food by comparing it with listening to recorded popular music. And then as I tried to like argue, there's this similarities, relevant similarities between those two types of um, uh, appreciation, uh, then maybe like looking at, uh, Music also helps us like uh, uh, throw fresh light on the appreciation of food as well. 
Okay. And as another like preliminary remark, uh, it seems to me that that when we think about food and the aesthetic aesthetic appreciation of food, then one way to argue for the aesthetic significance of food appreciation is to claim that at least some dishes have like symbolic or maybe representation content. So in Karen Korsmaier's book, Making Sense of Taste, there are some interesting suggestions as to how food can, can uh, exemplify certain, certain interesting uh, uh, thoughts or values. Uh, and I don't want to like say that this kind of approach uh, is is bad or, or we shouldn't one shouldn't engage in it. It's like it's actually very fruitful and very interesting, and it's entirely possible that that uh, what I mean, what, I mean whatever I I say in this talk, I mean the value of this kind of uh, approach to food still stands, <laughs> but uh, but seems but. It seems to me that that if uh, the focus is so much on the symbolic representation content of, of, of dishes, um, then this kind of approach uh, might like, is in danger of looking away from the flavor properties themselves, and and locates the aesthetic value of food in something else than those flavor properties. And kind of analogously, in case of popular music, or or at least like pop music, which is actually more, more, more uh, narrow uh, domain. In case of pop music, at least uh, there's like, you can see quite a bit of this kind of representation approach uh, where representational content is seen as this kind of primary focus of appreciation. So um, I hope I don't do injustice to Enrico Terone, so who who help, because it seems to me that he his view is along those lines that pop songs are primarily appreciated through empathy, where the mind of the singer is the appreciative target. And if you look at the Nick Wiltshire's criticism of of Terone, then his positive view is still that the appreciative focus of pop songs is on the representative thoughts and feelings. So, in case of popular music and pop music in particular, uh, there's this also this kind of approach, you can also see that kind of approach where, where uh, the focus is on, on the representation content. Um, but it seems to me that, that uh, there's also different kind of engagement with popular music where the this representation or content doesn't matter that much uh, and like, these kind of engagements are best exemplified by, by, for instance, listening to songs written in foreign languages, which you can still appreciate aesthetically, I guess, I take it, and uh, appreciating instrumental tracks, for instance. So bringing out now Korsmeyer on one hand and, and uh, Theron and Wiltshire on the other, uh, uh, to repeat, my intention is not to even like reject anything in their particular views, it's more like I just want to kind of bring out this like, context where there's one particular theoretical focus, but uh, that kind of uh, theoretical focus uh, kind of might hide from a view even, at least sometimes, the other possible theoretical focus, which kind of looks at the, the sensory properties of, of like of the of the uh, thing that is appreciated, so both in the case of food and popular music, this kind of representational approach can overlook. I mean, let's say not tends to, but can overlook the aesthetic value of flavor properties and sonic properties in themselves, respectively. But uh, I'm like, what I want to discuss in what follows is how appreciation of food, qua food and music, qua music, music at its basic level can focus on how their sensory properties unfold and not so much on what the, their symbolic or representation content is. So just to define my, my, my um, 
Mm. To find a focus on my approach, I wanted to discuss these these things. Okay, now now we can move to the meat of the issue, so to speak. So I'm going to talk about basic capricity focus. I already, I think, used those terms. And I'm going to talk about basic capricity focus in case of food and music, which I take to be uh, relevantly similar. And hopefully the following um, quote helps to illustrate what I mean by basic capricity focus in case of food. And I suspect some of you know this passage already, those who have read uh, Tom Lopez's book, Being for Beauty, because he also refers to it or cites it. So, and it's by Mark Miller, who is this, I think, relatively well-known chef. And uh, the, here he, he describes the flavor profile of a raisin. So I read it. Um, when you bite down, it is sweet in the beginning. It has a medium tempo and flavor. It becomes tannic on the edge, it gets a little bit juicier, and it gets highly accentuated sugars and a little bit dust, dusty in the meat palate over time. There's a, there's a certain intensity that goes up, and then a sweetness dies off, and then a tannin dies off, and what you're left with is a kind of seedy little bit of sweetness that follows through. What you have is this curve of experience from a single raisin, exclamation mark. Um, I, I, I wanted to bring out this particular quote because I think nice thing about it is that although I mean Mark Miller presumably uh, is much more able to discriminate different flavors than like ordinary person uh, has but uh, that it seems to me at least for me and I, I hopefully for others it's the description is pretty easily recognizable it's not like a very obscure uh, esoteric comment of some sort of food critic but it's actually uh, everyone who's tasted raisin and whose flavor like whose tasting capacities are in proper order can pretty much recognize this description from and relate the, it to their own experience uh, and i think it also illustrates this uh, basic appreciative focus which is on the uh, way in which a flavor profile of a, of a, of a dish or a particular uh, item develops over time and the whole focus is on the development in the present in the moment from moment to moment um, so if that's if you can call this the basic appreciative focus then I, I i hopefully it's possible to make an interesting comparison with uh music appreciation uh so uh Gerard levinson has defended defending the so-called concatenationism about uh, music comprehension, which is most uh, supposed to contrast with so-called architectonicism about music appreciation. And uh, for Levinson, uh, what, what concatenation means is that uh, when it comes to basic appreciative focus, uh, in case of music, uh, the focus is on a small scale Temporal uh, the sonic structures and uh, and how and when one one exercises focus when one then uh, when one uh, follows the piece or the development of the sonic profile uh, from moment to moment and concatenation is in contrast with archi architectonicism because architectonicism uh, claims that that uh, actually this large scale structural and formal features of a piece uh, have to factor into the basic appreciative focus as well for one to really actually comprehend the uh, what what one is listening and if in the case of Levinson also I mean it's his interest is on in uh, classical music but uh, for me, it seems that concatenationism can be maybe relatively unintuitive when it comes to classical music, given that in case of uh, pieces in classical music, large scale formal features arguably are relevant because without really grasping them, one really doesn't really get the point of a piece. 
but it seems to me that actually concatenation is relatively like relatively more plausible in the case of food like in the case of popular music because uh, there that's my empirical uh, bet that that uh, ordinary listener uh, is not so much interested in this kind of broader this kind of broader structure of the piece and they don't really need even to be interested in that for them to exercise their basic appreciative focus. So that's the idea of concatenationism in, in case of music. And I think when we now think of food appreciation, then it makes sense to uh, say that in the case of food, this basic appreciative focus concerns attentive absor absorption in the unfolding of the flavor profile and sensitivity to the changes in flavor in the moment. And those kind of wider temporal scales or the formal features have only secondary, secondary significance, if, if any significance. Um, so that's also, I think, corresponds, hopefully corresponds well to Mark Miller's uh, description of, uh, of how he uh, experiences raisins also. So, what I've, I've tried to, to suggest, at least, uh, I've tried to suggest that uh, this kind of basic appreciative focus in case of both food and popular music appreciation concerns those moment-to-moment uh, -moment, uh, developments in the flavor profile or sonic profile. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many issues with this uh, proposal, but I also, myself, I would like to bring up certain uh, issues which concern the putatively glaring differences between music and food. So in case of music, uh, expressive content arguably is very important also when it comes, when, when, it con when, when these kind of moment to moment uh, small scale appreciation is, is concerned. Uh, and it evidence also bears it out, like empirical evidence bears it out, given that, for instance, in a study by Juslin and Isaksen, a uh, Swedish uh, music psychologist, uh, expression was rated as the most important criterion of aesthetic value in music by both musicians and non musicians. Uh, and on the, on the other hand, in case of um, food, the expressive content arguably is not relevant. It's even like open question if food has expressive content. Um, so here we seem to have a pretty, pretty glaring difference between those two domains. So what can I say in response? Well, I have like three kind of tentative uh, responses. Um, First one, I think, is the weakest, but I still want to point out that uh, the research by the same research, like same, sci like same scientist, uh, has also brought out that regular listeners are not well positioned to identify like fine-grained emotional content of music, like whether music uh, expresses anger or grief or what's well, kind of particular emotions, rather. According to Yuslin, uh, the expressive, like what uh, regular listeners do identify are these more coarse grained, uh, coarse grained feature, features like valence and, and intensity. And so, I mean, this um, point was just in order to kind of uh, temper this claim regarding the importance of expressive content. So, not any kind of exp expressive content is, is crucial in the case of music appreciation. It's more these coarse kind of feature, kind of features. And perhaps very speculatively, speculatively it, it is possible to argue that, that um, uh, food can also at least instantiate these more coarse grained features. But uh, elaboration of, on that point would be for Q&A or for future. Uh, research because I want to also consider two other responses to the expressive content concern. So it's a, even if expressive content is really important in case of music appreciation, it's still important to note that expressiveness of music 
is reali realized by the base sonic properties of the piece. And the attentive experience of the unfolding of such base properties can be still common uh, both to music and food. So the fact that there are these really like noticeable differences between music and, and food doesn't, doesn't mean that there, are, there aren't uh, interesting similarities that still deserve our attention. And as a third uh, point, although the expressive content of, of food is very much under debate, uh, is de debatable, uh, I think is what's pretty much given is that food definitely arouses feelings and even emotions. So like acceleration and comfort, uh, et cetera. Uh, and presumably, again, it's, it's my, my empirical bet, <laughs> I might be wrong, but in the case of popular music, uh, it's, it's, it's plausible that listeners own arousal actually matters more for appreciation than the expressive content of the music itself. So as a very, like uh, very speculatively, I would even like suggest that maybe even people really stress the importance of, importance of expression as it is, is revealed in those studies. It, uh, they might sometimes just mix up the expressive content of music with their own uh, emotion reaction. So, so arguably the, the, the arousal, uh, the, the emotions that, sorry, the emotions that uh, music arouses are actually even, even actually more central than the emotions that are expressed in the, in the piece. Um, as a, another possible, like, uh, possible difference between food and music, and here I'm going to be quite brief because I want to gallop through other stuff as well in my talk. Um, and uh, here I'm not, here it's very tentative as well, but case could, could be made that in case of food appreciation, there's more room for the control of the experience in, in terms of how the consumption experience is shaped because uh, the, the uh, eater can well choose how they pick up the food, how they chew the food, whatnot. But in case of music, you could say that, well, maybe the room for control is less so because you can, you can maybe close off your ears, but uh, you can't maybe do much more. But uh, here, if we focus on music in recorded context, then it seems to me that that uh, level of control over that kind of music is, is much higher. Um, so I, I'm not really sure what to make of, of this possible concern regarding my, my comparisons, but I think it's kind of interesting thing to think about a bit more, like how agencies involved in, or in food appreciation on one hand, on one hand, and music appreciation on the other. Um, but I don't think there's this immediate uh, challenge to, to what I I've tried to try to argue for. Okay, so I what I've tried to do thus far, I've tried to like suggest that that uh, there's like interesting similarity, interesting similarities between uh, food appreciation and uh, music appreciation uh, when it comes to their when it comes to the basic appreciative focus. But the remaining part of the talk, I would like to discuss some like further questions further issues. And the first one concerns the value that this appreciative focus, uh, appreciative focus uh, could give access to. Uh, and I'm going to talk about replay value soon, but before that, um, we should think of um, the, 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 we should think of that about that appreciative focus a bit bit more. So uh, it seems to me that there are two aspects to the to that. Namely, first thing is that this exercise of that kind of focus is pleasurable. Uh, in it usually it is at least pleasurable. And I, I'm interested in cases where it is pleasurable at least. And a bit more speculatively, I, I suspect it also trains the powers of flavor discrimination. Um, if you, especially if you 
uh, over different, like over a number of occasions, you you like engage in that kind of engage in that the same kind of exercise uh, with respect to one kind of dish, then arguably it improves your ability to discriminate different flavors in in that dish. Uh, at least I I'm I hope that that's what happened with me when I repeatedly had my kimchi free fried rice over almost two years. Um, and if that's the case, uh, then the pleasure bit of that kind of appreciation can be compared with Moen Mathen's conception of facilitating pleasures. So in different papers, I think uh, Mathen has used slightly different terms, but at least when he talks about facil facilitating pleasure, uh, he has in mind pleasures taken in activities that motivate further engagement in that activity. So, uh, they kind of like make, make this kind of activity easier to, to perform. And in the case of um, um, pleasure taken in, 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 in the exercise of that kind of appreciative focus, uh, I, I would say that that uh, this pleasure also can be at least compared with uh, the facilitating facilitating pleasure as Mathen uh, defines it. But um, interestingly, it's given that both like songs or tracks and and dishes, uh, appreciation of them has this natural endpoint. I mean, they're relatively uh short term uh, experiences uh it it makes sense to argue also that it's not like this pleasure taken in food appreciation just motivates maintaining the focus it also uh makes sense to think that the pleasure taken in that uh, exercise can also motivate the engagement with the dish again after an appropriate interval uh, so it motivates returning to that dish again and again. So using again that music analogy, I, I, I proposed that analogously to songs in virtue of generating that kind of motivation to return to the piece, um, dishes have re replay value for the agent you know, using these, these terms, uh, kind of even, I use these terms to accentuate the music food comparison also. Um, so, okay, if, if there are replay values, which consist of like the, the capacity of a, of a dish to, to, to motivate uh, further like repeated engagements, uh, there are also possible concerns regarding this idea, basically, uh, at least when it comes to the aesthetics of food appreciation. So there's this concern, and I'm, I'm sure there are many others, is that uh, this kind of idea of replay value, I mean, this, this replay value is like very, it, it lacks subtlety, and at best can be considered only as this kind of very minor, minor value, if even value at all, because like maybe a straightforward comparison with this uh, replay value idea um, is in a music context is the earworm. So earworm is such a song which motivates you to kind of replay it in your head over and over again. It's all, almost always a very annoying thing. And if now one wants to claim that uh, this is a the song has replay value, then uh, Either this replay value is very minor, or it's very, or or one might might, might even ask why why call value for why call it value at all. Same similarly in case of fast food, I mean fast food also has in a way replay value as also has kind of replay value, but um, again it it seems like it's very minor then. Um, here, I just want to mention one response here. 
And here I'd like to invoke uh, John Dyke, who in his quite recent paper on uh, the aesthetics of country music has considered like maybe like this at least comparable issue, namely that peop some people might argue that uh, country music, the value of country music, given that country music is very simple, it also, because of this, the value of country music is very minor, if, if a value at all. And Tyke has this pretty nice and interesting response to that, that uh, concern or ob objection. Uh, so I, I quote, um, simple art can play a greater practical role because it is easy to grasp. Country music can seep into our daily lives. We can make it part of everyday driving, drinking and dancing. For many folks, there is no time to experience art apart from everyday life. And there is no mental space for art that requires mental acrobatics. If art is to knit, is to knit into the weave of our everyday lives, then it often needs to be sonically and lyrically simple. And now, like analogously to, to, to Dyke's response to that, that concern, I would suggest that um, by having repay value, food can still, but I, I can still, I can argue that food by having replay value can more easily be weaved into everyday life than more complex objects of appreciation. Uh, also in the case of uh, food appreciation. Uh, so this, this con concern might not have much bite insofar as replay value, uh, the importance of replay value can be vindicated in such a way, in a, in a way how, how uh, Jake tried to indicate uh, value, of value of simplicity in case of country music. Now, um, that's basically the last bit, and it's um, the, the shortest one, I think. So in, my, in this last part, I would just like to very briefly discuss this possibility that uh, replay value also generates a certain kind of reasons, certain kind of reason, certain kind of aesthetic reason. And here I appeal to uh, T. Gwen's uh, also very recent work. I think this is still forthcoming. It's not published that paper uh, called Transparency Surveillance, I think was the title. And he makes, tries to make this case that there are some considerations, reasons that can only be adequately understood by members, members of a particular group based on their shared experience and uh, let's call them in intimate reasons. So Gwen's context in that paper is uh, mostly uh, expertise and like public communication or ex expertise where he tries to argue that, well, uh, the value of transparency uh, is sometimes quite dangerous given that if an uh, expert has to uh, follow, like as to uh, let themselves be guided by the value of transparency all the time, then this uh, makes it so that that expert, uh, in order to convey their reasons in an understandable way for an audience, have to distort those reasons in their communication, given that the wider audience is not really able to fully understand the expert's, expert's reasons. And now it might sound like a bit uh, funny that I, I kind of uh, uh, appeal to intimate reasons in, in my context, given that there's, it doesn't concern expertise at all, but it's notable that also Gwen is actually more, although the, the, the focus is on, on the, the issues in expertise and science, uh, he actually briefly considers also how Aesthetic reasons are intimate reasons, given that in order to grasp them, one has to be uh, familiar uh, familiar with the uh, uh, object of aesthetic concern. And so, using this idea, I, I can I think we can apply like employ this notion of intimate reasons in uh, in the present context also, 
very tentatively, of course. So what I want to suggest uh, is that the replay value, value of food can generate intimate aesthetic reasons. So reasons to do what? Like reasons to appreciate the dish in a particular way, uh, maybe for something else as well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, the idea behind this suggestion is that uh, intimate aesthetic reasons are only shareable between agents who have shared a sufficiently similar trajectory of engagement with the target of aesthetic concern. Uh, and only because of sharing the same trajectory of engagement, one can have one can be in a position to grasp that replay value. So insofar as, as this kind of shared um, uh, the shared experience, the precondition for, for sharing the reasons, uh, the uh, the exercise of, a, of appreciative focus with respect to a particular dish can perhaps also uh, generate intimate reasons, intimate aesthetic reasons, you know. But uh, as I as I said, that's like the shortest bit. I I mean, I, I I'm very much interested in what what you think. Um, but uh, at least uh, I would like to. Uh, conclude at this point. So what uh, I try to argue for, at least suggest in, in this, this talk, were like three ideas. Uh, first uh, was that food and popular music uh, share similar basic appreciative focus. Uh, second claim was that that focus gives access to the replay, replay value of the dish or the uh, piece uh, respectively. And the third claim was that the replay value generates intimate aesthetic reasons. And also you can see some references here. Uh, and that's, that's it. I'm very much interested in what you think about these rather rambling, rambling thoughts of mine. I, I thought maybe it was appropriate to also finish Finish with like a half eaten picture of a half eaten dish. We have a half baked colloquium. Now I finish in such a so appropriate way myself as well. Thank you.